Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Knoll. I'm the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association Star Party Manager. And welcome to our virtual star party. All right, so here we, uh, here we are with uh, the current position of the planets for June. And if you look, uh, you can kind of see Earth uh, up here. Mercury's right in line uh, with us in the sun. So it's actually down behind our, it's gonna be in the glare of the sun. Uh, Venus is pretty close to the sun, so it's probably not going to be visible, very visible. Uh, Mars is right out here, and it's, uh, it's in good shape. It's uh, going to be in the western sky. And as we zoom out, you can see there's Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they'll be up uh, pretty late. Jupiter rises, uh, let's see, Jupiter rises around midnight and Saturn about 11 p.m. Arizona time. So uh, those are going to be uh, pretty late objects. And then if we keep going out, we've got Uranus, Neptune, and then poor little Pluto out here. Pluto was demoted uh, oh, several years ago to a dwarf planet. And as you can see, if you compare the orbits of the other planets, to Pluto, you can see that it's a little bit elongated, a little bit different. And then if we start looking at the view uh, from the edge, then you can really see a difference between the main planets and Pluto. Most of the planets orbit in the same plane as the, uh, as the sun, whereas Pluto <clears throat> is often uh, in a slightly different elliptical orbit. So Pluto, they think, is probably the, one of the larger objects and uh, one of the ones we've seen uh, at the closest one for the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt is uh, just kind of a belt of leftover stuff from the solar system formation beyond Pluto. And Pluto is just one of the Kuiper Belt objects. Once we get the James Webb Telescope uh, up later this year, then hopefully uh, they'll be able to start finding some more uh, really cool stuff out in the uh, out in the Kuiper Belt. So let's, uh, and then right now in the night sky, um, here is our current view of the night sky. Um, and if you, uh, if you look evening, uh, you know, after dark or so, if you look down towards the southeast, southeast you can see Scorpius right down here. Uh, it, it's one of the few constellations that actually does look like a scorpion. Uh, straight overhead, pretty much, is going to be Virgo, Virgo the Maiden, um, and it'll be pretty much straight up. And there's a lot of things, and we'll probably look at some of those uh, at some point in time. And then off towards the west, just west of Virgo, you can see Leo the Lion. You can see the lion outlined here. Um, Leo is actually kind of easy to find in the night sky, at least the main, because um, what you can look for is you look for a backwards question mark right in here. So kind of look straight up and you'll see a backwards question mark. This bright star right here is uh, Regulus. And then this is the name of the line. And then the rest of the line right now is kind of pointing towards the east. Uh, and then looking up towards the uh, north, you can see Ursa Major, which is the big bear. That's this guy right here. Uh, part of the big bear is, is the Big Dipper. So you can see the handle of the Big Dipper right here, which is the tail of the bear. And then the bucket is kind of the main part of the torso. And then his legs come off the, the lower end of the bucket stars. And then it, there's kind of a faint star out here that denotes his head and it kind of stretches out. Um, the cool thing about the Big Dipper is it can, you can use it to actually help you find the North Star and the Little Dipper. So if you go off these two end stars right here of the bucket, They'll point right towards Polaris. Polaris will be the bright star that's out here. And that's the end of the handle of the Little Dipper and of the Little Bear. Here's the outline of the bear. It's a little bit hard to see because it's kind of crowded in there. The handle for uh, Ursa Minor, the Little Bear is, uh, the handle of the Little Dipper is part of Ursa Minor, it's the tail. And then the bucket part is right in here. Most people can only see Polaris and maybe these two end stars. If you can see the other stars in the handle and the little dipper, then you've got actually some pretty good, pretty good skies. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to uh, take a look at uh, several different kinds of galaxies. And so I wanted to make sure 
that you guys could uh, had a little idea of what they're all about. So there's basically three main types of uh, galaxies. There's spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, and then what we call irregular galaxies. We'll look probably look at several spiral galaxies. They're really cool because they have some very well-defined um, spiral arms, a nice clear nucleus in the center, uh, very pretty to look at. The, uh, they're also kind of medium-sized, so to somewhat large, but mostly medium-sized galaxies. You can they can be small to you know to only a few billion stars to maybe several hundred billion stars. Our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy, probably looks very similar to this, as is the Andromeda galaxy, which is the other large galaxy near us. Then we have elliptical galaxies. <clears throat> elliptical galaxies, they think, are kind of the result of maybe mergers of lots of other galaxies to include spiral galaxies. And they basically just kind of get all jumbled up into a big ball. So they don't have the defined structure that you would see in a spiral galaxy, um, but you have just kind of a ball. They're huge. They can have upwards of trillions of stars because they've, they've been formed by a lot of mergers of previous galaxies. The thought, the current thought right now is uh, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy would probably merge together in four to five billion years. When we do, we might form an elliptical galaxy because it'll just kind of take the, all the spiral arms and jumble everything up. And we have irregular galaxies, and there's a couple of types. Um, there's ones that are called lenticular galaxies, so they kind of kind of stretched out. Um, not uh, you know some they they could some of them could be spiral galaxies that we're just seeing the edge on. Uh, some of them aren't, but right in here you can see, and this is called the sombrero galaxy because it kind of looks like a sombrero hat. This would be the brim of the hat with the top and bottom part of the hat. So that's uh, one type of galaxy of the regular galaxy. And then another one, uh, type two one, is when, when two galaxies collide. So when they're first starting to merge, they might stretch each other out and do some weird things to the stars and the dust and the gas. And, uh, and, and that makes them just look kind of irregular. And that's, this is the picture here is the antenna galaxy. And then the other thing that we're going to look a little bit at tonight is uh, the kind of the stars, the evolution of stars. Uh, all the stars generally start with a uh, out of a cloud of cold hydrogen gas. The smaller stars, like our sun, will eventually they'll in the when they're on the main sequence they'll last for you know ten billion years on average or so, and then when they get towards the end of their life, they will start puffing off their uh, their gas and they kind of expand out into what's called a red giant. So. They'll get a lot bigger, but they're also a lot more diffuse and, and you know, the, the mass is still the same. They're just larger. And then eventually they'll puff off their outer uh, gas. And that's what you see coming off of here. And that we call a planetary nebula. And then finally, uh, what will be left will be kind of the core of the star. And that's a white dwarf. So this will be the, the fate of the sun in a long, long time. We don't have to worry about it for any time soon. It's going to be at least uh, another four or five billion years, a long ways. And then the larger stars uh, like uh, um, Betelgeuse uh, and some of those will become red supergiants. So they'll start off on their main sequence, but they may only last for millions of years, not billions of years. And then they become a red supergiant. So it's similar to a red giant, just much, much larger. And then finally, um, <clears throat> they will explode and become a supernova. And we'll, uh, sometimes we can look at uh, supernova remnants and that's the gas that has expanded off of this, these red giant, super giants after they've exploded. And then uh, they'll either become a neutron star. So they're just kind of a, a big, a, they're much, much smaller than what they were before. And they're just a very dense neutrons. Or if they're really big, then they could become condensed down into a, a stellar mass black hole. So this isn't the super massive black holes that we have in the center of the galaxy, uh, but these are more stellar or star sized black holes. So we'll see some of those kinds of objects probably over, over tonight as well. All right, the last thing I wanna briefly mention before we get into doing some observing is a little bit on astronomy terms. Um, throughout the program, you'll hear us refer to object as a Messier or M number. 
<clears throat> Those are objects that were uh, recorded by Charles Messier back in the 1700s as he was looking for comets. And uh, he noticed these things didn't move, but they kind of looked like comets because they were fuzzy. And so he chose to record them so that he wouldn't confuse them with future observations. And they've now become some of the best objects for amateurs to view. Well, also uh, another large catalog that we uh, use is the New General Catalog or NGC. So you'll hear us refer to NGC numbers as well. Um, you will talk a little bit about magnitudes. The lower the number, the brighter the object. Normally a magnitude six or a little lower than that, maybe a five is a uh, naked eye. So that means it's something you can see with your naked eye. If it's a higher number than six, then you probably need a telescope or binoculars. And then finally, uh, a light year. <clears throat> light year is a distance that light travels in one year. So at 186,000 miles per second, that's about 6 trillion miles per year or about 9.4, 9.5 trillion kilometers. It's, uh, so we use this to measure distance between objects. Now what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the astronomy equipment. We'll start off with Jim O'Connor. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, what you're seeing in front of there is exactly where I'm sitting right now, except it's uh, nicely a bit darker. Uh, my equipment is, starts out with a 10 inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. It, but rather than using an eyepiece in it, I've put a, a video camera on the back end. That telescope, and you can see it farther away on the left and up close and personal on the right, uh, it's a very old one. It's almost 30 years old, so I've got a new rather newer mount it's on, the thing that holds it up and, and lets it move around the sky. It's a Celestron AVX equatorial mount. So it's a 10-inch schmidt grass grain telescope on an equatorial mount. Uh, the camera is called a Mellencam and Terminator. It's got a high sensitivity CCD. It's one of the highest sensitivity uh, video chips uh, in the world, uh, but it's small. It's only a quarter of an inch on a side, that chip. So it's only got 377,000 pixels. So it does not give you a whole lot of grabbing of light, but it can go a long way away and grab it. It's in full color and it's got a thermoelectric cooler on the inside. And that's what the, if you look closer at the, closely at the camera, you see these big fans on the outside. That's keeping it cool. But that whole setup is what I use when I go out and show things. And if you look in the left-hand picture, there is a uh, monitor on a stand. That monitor is what I use uh, for public uh, viewing because more people can see what I'm looking at and then I know what they're seeing. Jim? Okay, thank you. And now over to Rick. You'll see that my scope is of a different design than, than Jim's. Uh, mine is a refractor telescope uses uh, lenses rather than mirrors. It's a four inch uh, stellar view uh, refractor on a uh, very large uh, Losmandy G11 mount. It gives me very good stability for imaging. Uh, and I'm running an ASI 2600 color uh, cooled camera. Uh, the sensor inside this camera has been specially adapted for this service, but it's very similar to what you would find inside a, a modern uh, digital uh, SLR camera. All right, thanks, Rick and Bernie. Hi, everyone. I'm Bernie Stinger, and welcome to the Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm presently out at our dark sky site in the Chiricahua Mountains, about 100 miles southeast of Tucson. And at that site, we have several permanent peer telescopes. One of them is the one I'll be using this evening which is a nine inch folded refractor. And it's mounted onto this uh, heavy duty astrophysics mount. Now all of the, uh, the camera control and everything is coming back that big black wire on the left side back into the control room, which is the white building in the upper left corner. And that's where I'm sitting right now uh, controlling the camera 
and what we'll be looking at this evening. Uh, the camera I'm using is a Mellencam DS432C. It's a color camera, it's a CMOS camera, and it's very sensitive to light. Uh, some of the objects we'll be looking at tonight are very, very faint. Uh, so I'm using my most sensitive camera. Back to you, Jim. All right, so that's kind of just a quick overview of the equipment. So now let's get on to some deep sky observing. My first object tonight is called the Medusa Nebula. It's a planetary nebula up in the constellation Gemini. It's also goes by the name of APN 205.1 plus 14.2. I know that's an exciting name. That's why they use Medusa Nebula instead. This is a very, very faint object. Um, it's not something that uh, I would recommend uh, the, the uh, beginning amateur to, uh, to try to look for uh, in a telescope because, uh, because of its very, very low surface brightness. Uh, but if you do get a camera and you want to give it a shot, uh, it is in Gemini and uh, it shouldn't be uh, uh, too hard to, uh, to find. This was discovered in 1955 by George Abel. Now, the, the date 1955 kind of gives you an idea of how faint it is, because uh, for something to be discovered that late into the 20th century uh, means it was, it was missed by many, many people for many, many years. Uh, most objects like this in, at least planetaries were discovered uh, in the, uh, the 17th um, and 18th century, or the 18th and 19th century, um, not, not up until the 20th century. Um, and it goes by the name of Abel 21 as well. That's another name for it. It's 1500 light years away. So it's relatively close. And it's about four light years wide. So if you go from the, the top of the, the reddish area there down to the bottom, you're talking about four light years. Now, this is a planetary uh, nebula, which means that it was formed by an exploding star. When that star exploded, it, it's, it, it threw off a shell of gas, its outer atmosphere. And we know it was hydrogen because it's mostly red. These, these red streaks in here are ionized hydrogen. And they're being ionized by the, uh, the parent star or stars in the general area. The actual parent star has never actually been determined. It could be any one of these. It's very hard to track it back uh, unless it exploded again and you could catch it. It's called the Medusa Nebula because uh, it kind of looks like a hairdo and these, uh, uh, these streaks in here, um, someone or several people felt it reminded them of the head of Medusa and the snakes coming off of the hairdo of the head of Medusa. So that's why it's called the Medusa Nebula. So what we're looking at here is known as the Orion Nebula. This nebula is located in the uh, Orion constellation. For those of you familiar with the Orion constellation, you, most people are familiar with this belt going across the three stars of his belt. This is located below his belt in his sword. Uh, this object is actually visible uh, with just a pair of binoculars. If you were to look up when Orion's up in the sky uh, with a pair of binoculars, you should be able to see uh, the Orion Nebula if you know right where to look. This is one of the brightest nebulas in our sky. Um, it is, you are seeing it with, with your naked eye when you look up there, you can see the brightness from it. It's also one of the closest um, nebulas to the Earth, um, and it's an active star forming region. 
that center core brightness you're seeing is because there's several bright young stars in there and there's new stars being made inside this cloud. The, con the nebula is so close to Earth that um, it's an actively studied by, by astronomers because it is so large and so close, it's an easy star forming region to, to study. So to give you an idea of its size and its closeness, um, it's only about, it's about 1,400 light years away, which uh, in stellar terms is not that far away. And it's about 34 light years across. So you're talking about a very, very large structure. Now, right next to him over to the right is actually a separate uh, little nebula known as the Running Man. And uh, from your perspective, he's upside down right now. Um, his head is towards the bottom. He's got two little arms sticking out and his legs sticking up. That's the little Running Man Nebula. Both of these are part of the Orion uh, uh, complex. There is uh, nebulous gas running all up the, the left side of, of Orion. And there's several other uh, nebulas uh, north or yeah, north of this, above this. So that is the Orion Nebula. Yeah, and if uh, if you remember, uh, you know, from any previous discussions, whatnot. So, like Rick mentioned, that's a stellar nursery. So, stars are being born in there, and it'll produce hundreds, if not thousands, of stars. Very gorgeous picture, Rick. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jim, the last of the guys showing off interesting things here, and what we're looking at is an open cluster whose number in the catalog is NGC 188, or sometimes called Caldwell 1. But its name is the Polarissima Cluster. And the reason that it's called Polarissima is there are, uh, there are many objects in catalogs that have the name Polarissima. It means they're next to a pole of some kind. In this case, it's uh, an open cluster that's uh, uh, near the pole of the Milky Way galaxy as we look up. Uh, the Polarisma cluster is an open cluster about 23 light years in diameter. It's in the constellation Cepheus. So uh, that means that a sometimes it can be awfully low in the sky or sometimes a little bit, uh, a lot higher in the sky, but it's only five degrees away from our pole star uh, in the sky. It's um, unlike most open clusters that drift apart after a few million years because of the gravitational interaction with the Milky Way, NGC 188 lies far above the plane of the Milky Way. It um, is one of the most ancient uh, open clusters known. Uh, it's further away from our galaxy center than our sun is, and it's its age is approximately 6.8 billion years. So its star's mass is holding this thing together. NGC 188 is about 5,000 light years away from Earth, which puts, us, puts it above the Milky Way's disk and further from the center of the galaxy than the sun. My next object is Thor's helmet. It also goes by the name of NGC 2359. Thor's helmet is an emission nebula in Canis Major. Canis Major is the big dog. That's the constellation that follows to the east of Orion. It's also known as the duck nebula, although I'm, I've not been able to see a duck in it. Uh, but a helmet uh, is a little easier to spot. The reason they call it Thor's helmet is because of the circular area that you can see being the, the helmet or the, uh, and off to the right and left, of course, top and bottom in this image, but off, off to the one side is uh, an emission spike that goes off in, in that direction. And then there's another spike or 
section that goes off in the other direction. And it kind of looks like um, the, the shape of a spiked helmet, like Thor uh, used. It's 12,000 light years distant. And it's 30 light years wide. It has this shape because uh, it's a planetary nebula, again, like the Medusa Nebula, that after a star blew up, the shell of gas that radiated out from the, um, from the exploding star is slamming into uh, molecular clouds, clouds of, of gas that are out in, in the, uh, out in the space. And when it slams into those, uh, those clouds, it causes the gas to ionize. So you get what's called a, a shock wave uh, that, that causes the ionization. The main star is in a pre-supernova stage. So it hasn't gone supernova yet, but it will soon. This nebula is between 80,000 and 240,000 years old. Now, usually they define them down a little better than that, but this one has such a huge range because of all the different shock waves that are involved with and it's hard to pin down an exact age because of that. There's a variety of different colors in there as well. You'll see blue, or blues, lots of blues, uh, but also reds. Uh, if you look down in this area here, for example, uh, you'll see in that shock wave where it's slamming into the molecular clouds that this area has reddish hues as well. So we're looking at hydrogen gas, we're looking at oxygen, um, and many other gases that are involved uh, in this nebula. This object filling the screen is the Rosette Nebula. It's a large uh, circular emission nebula located in the constellation uh, Monoceros. It surrounds a cluster of young hot stars known as the Rosette Cluster. You can see them there in the center. There's kind of a hole in the middle of this nebula. The, the cluster itself was discovered uh, quite a while ago, back in 1690. Uh, it was recognized as a cluster. The nebula itself wasn't discovered until quite later. Um, it's, it's quite dim, uh, even in a visual telescope. It requires uh, photographic techniques to be able to um, pull out that, that nebulosity. The nebula itself um, is, is large. It, it covers an area in our sky about five times the size of the full moon. So it's a very, very large object. It's one of the most photographed objects. It's really one of the most pretty uh, and detailed nebulas up there. Um, so the reason it's, it's, it's red, it's dominantly red, is that's because of the hydrogen gas. And that is the color that hydrogen gas uh, puts out when it's being um, excited in an emission nebula like this, when, the, when there's energy behind it. The total diameter of what you're seeing there is about 130 light years across. And that central hole is about 30 light years across. So the, the reason that there's a hole in the, in the center there is that the group of stars that are there in the middle have created um, stellar wind. They, they put out radiation and that radiation is called a stellar wind. And that wind has swept out that central core. And that's why we have that, that hole that, that's there. But this is another uh, a nebula that is an active star forming region that the gases in there are coalescing 
and and condensing down into forming new stars. The object in front of you is Messier object number one. Uh, Charles Messier was a uh, employee of the French Navy. He was uh, assigned to be the chronicler of dynamic events. So he spent his career with the French Navy uh, looking for comets. When he would find something that wasn't a comet but might fool someone, he noted it down. This is the very first one he found. It's called Messier number one or the Crab Nebula. It's in the constellation Taurus. And it's the remains of a star that was at least eight times as big as our sun. What happened is it used up all its hydrogen and started making more uh, elements. And as it started going through stages of making more and more elements, it got to be a red giant. And then unfortunately, when it got to making silicon and iron, uh, when it started making those, the debris from them or the byproducts of them uh, sucked all the energy out of the other layers of the star and it collapsed on itself in about 10 seconds. Usually when a, when a uh, star that's that large starts to make iron, the star has about 10 seconds or so to live. So it blows itself apart catastrophically in a nuclear explosion that creates a lot of the materials that we need for life. Uh, this object right here is, uh, um, ran out of its hydrogen and collapsed and the entire nebula is about five and a half light years across. At the center of it is the remains of the star. There was some debris left over and it's small. It's about the size of a uh, small city and, um, the common name comes from uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Rossi, uh, who observed the object in 1840 using a 36 inch telescope and produced a drawing that looked like a crab. We know when it happened because it was documented both in China and in the United States. It happened in 1054 on July the 4th. The Chinese who uh, were prolific star viewers uh, star observers were looking for what they called visiting stars. And they saw this event happen. The next morning, July the 5th, it was noticed by the populations around what's called in the United States, the Four Corners area, uh, the Anasazi culture, the area around White Canyon, Navajo Canyon, um, and in Chaco Canyon. And we can know about it because it was sketched and left as a glyph or a hieroglyph on walls and cave paintings and cave art, because it shows that as a, uh, an exploded star, because they saw it in the daytime and it looked like a bright sun, but very small. And so what they did was they put next to it what they saw as far as the moon at the time, a crescent moon, only a few fingers away in the drawings. And it turns out that the moon, crescent moon, was only about a half a degree away in the sky when that happened. So the, uh, the Native American cultures uh, around in northern New Mexico and Arizona and the Chinese were the people who documented this. And we know very precisely that it happened in the year 1054 on July the 4th. Okay, my next object is one of my very favorites. It's a edge on galaxy in Coma Berenices. It goes by the name of NGC 4565. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have a common name, uh, but it's a beautiful edge on. One of the beautiful parts of this galaxy is not only is it edge on, but there's a beautiful dust lane uh, that runs down, right down the, the center of it. And the orientation of the galaxy is not exactly at 90 degrees to us. 
it's just tilted ever so slightly forward. So we can see this side of it in, in my image here, uh, the left top side of it a little better than the bottom side. And you can see very faintly that there appears to be spiral arms spiraling around uh, this galaxy. And also the central core of the galaxy where most of the stars are is very, very bright uh, on the top, but not so bright on the bottom, which also gives you the, uh, the distinct impression that we're looking at it uh, ever so slightly it, uh, tilted towards us. This is 40 million light years distant. So it's far, far beyond our galaxy. It was discovered in 1785 by William Herschel in the late 1700s. It's in the coma group of galaxies. So we have a local group of galaxies and then we have groups of galaxies that are nearby us but not part of our local group. This is part of the coma group of galaxies, which is fairly close by being 40 million light years. This is thought to be a barred spiral. So there, there may be a, a bar of light or star formation uh, right down the center, but it's really hard to tell from the, uh, the angle of view that we have available to This one should be visible in smaller telescopes. If you want to take a look, try to spot it. Uh, if you have a go-to scope, plug in NGC 4565 and have fun. So this is known as the Flaming Star Nebula you can see some red glow of the nebula around that one bright star in the middle. And the red glow goes around it and, and towards the bottom of the frame and then back up around to the left side. Now, the star actually was not formed inside this cloud of gas. This star has had an interesting journey. Um, this star is, is known as A.E. Aruga, and it actually can trace its origin back down in Orion's belt. But uh, about 2.7 million years ago, um, this star and another star had a close encounter with a third star. And the, the encounter was so close, it caused them both to be ejected. And so this star ended up now above the Orion constellation. And it ended up, you know, near this cloud of gas. And it now helps light up this gas there. So that's why it's called the, the Flaming Star Nebula. The uh, gas itself is largely uh, hydrogen, hydrogen emission. This nebula is about 1,400 light years away from us. So it's relatively close. The Diameter, and I know it's a little hard to judge the diameter of something this irregular, but it's approximately uh, 12 and a half light years across on this, on this nebula. It's again, it's something that's uh, very difficult to see uh, visually. The, the star is easily seen. Uh, it's a very bright star to see, but the nebula itself takes uh, long photographic exposures to be able to see something like this. So th this object was not, uh, classified uh, by Mr. Messier, he, he could not have seen this with his equipment at, at, at the time. What you'll also notice in this image, you'll see two white lines, one going up and down and one going across the, uh, the top of the frame. Uh, what happened there is those are satellite tracks. Uh, during this exposure, two satellites went through my frame. So it's interesting to, to see uh, photographically, we don't like to have those. Uh, normally uh, in, our, in our images, 
when we get frames like this, we, we throw these frames out. We also have software that's able to average those lines out frame to frame. So then our final images, we, we don't see them, but I thought it might be interesting for, for you to see uh, what a satellite track lo looks like in a, in a photographic image. This object is a rather interesting uh, apparition in the sky. It's got a name that's called the 37 cluster. And because it looks like the number 37, if you have the right kind of telescope that has the image that displays the right way. I, this is a good time to explain what an open cluster is. An open cluster is a group of stars that were formed out of the same cloud of, of nebulosity, of hydrogen that formed them. And when it forms them, uh, eventually they will, uh, when they ignite as stars, it will actually remove the gas from around them. The, the nuclear reactions will actually blow the gas away. So all that's left is the stars. So this open cluster is a little different than most uh, uh, open clusters in that it has so few stars. Uh, this is, uh, NGC 2169, and it's in the Orion constellation. It has only about 30 stars in it, but they are all in the same group. And the way you tell is you see how much it changes over a long period of time, over decades or generations. And that's called their proper motion. And if they're all hanging together, that means they belong together. So that's the uh, 37 cluster. It's 3,600 light years from Earth. And it's only about seven light years across because that's all you've got is those uh, 30 stars. My next object is M87. It's also known as NGC 4486. This is a super giant elliptical galaxy in the constellation Virgo. So this fuzzy patch right in the center here is not a star, it's a galaxy. However, unlike many galaxies that we show you uh, on these video uh, uh, presentations, it, it doesn't have spiral arms. Uh, it, it looks more like a great big buzz ball. Uh, and that's why, one of the reasons why they call it an elliptical galaxy, because it, it has no distinct shape. There's about one trillion stars in this galaxy. So it's an enormous supergiant galaxy. It was discovered in 1781 by Charles Messier. And of course, he put it on his list of things that aren't comets. Uh, so it's number 87 on his list. It's also known as the smoking gun galaxy. And I'll explain why um, a little further on. It's 53 million light years distant. At the center, well, not exactly at the center, but near the, near the edge of the galaxy, uh, they discovered many years ago, a bright radio source. And they were trying to figure out where that radio source was coming from. Uh, it, be, it, it seemed like it was coming from not so much the center as it was coming from the edge of the galaxy. And uh, they were finally able to uh, zero in on it. And that radio source turned out to be a jet of superheated plasma that was being shot out from the center of the galaxy. And it was, uh, it was being thrown out over 5,000 light years from the center. Because of that, it was quite obviously coming from a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And that supermassive black hole has approximately six and a half 
billion suns uh, inside it. In other words, over the lifetime of that galaxy, that black hole is swallowed up six and a half billion suns. Now, why do they call it a smoking gun? Because that jet is visible under just the right conditions. And tonight it's visible. So if we zoom in on the galaxy, you can actually see that jet of gas that's shooting out of the galaxy itself, some 5,000 light years uh, out into space. And that is from the supermassive black hole. That black hole is spinning at like a top and from the top and the bottom of that spinning black hole is this super hot plasma that's being shot out. Now, they've looked for it going the other way. It hasn't been detected in the other direction, but it certainly has been, uh, certainly can be seen uh, in this direction. Now, those of you who've been maybe watching uh, scientific events uh, will have noticed back in 2019 that they published the, the first image of a black hole. And that is the black hole from the center of this galaxy. And that black hole that they imaged is what's squirting this hot plasma jet out into space. So th that's why they call it the smoking gun galaxy. Yeah, the, uh, the jet is uh, readily apparent even um, at uh, low magnification. Uh, in the upper left here is another galaxy. Uh, and you'll notice on that one, there is, there's no jet on that one, uh, just on M87. So it's very obvious that's M87, just from that spike, that plasma jet uh, being shot out of it. This object towards the center of the frame is an open cluster located in the constellation Auriga. It's one of three open clusters uh, located in the Auriga constellation. This one was labeled Messier 36. Messier 37 and 38 are also located in Auriga. The name of this constellation is the Pinwheel Cluster. And although some people can't say they can't see it, I've always thought I could kind of see the pinwheel structure to it. If you look in the center here, and then going out from the center, you see an arm there and an arm here and an arm going down there. And it even squint at it a little bit, you can kind of see a, a pinwheel structure to that. Now, this cluster was actually first recorded by Giovanni Battista Hederna sometime uh, around 1654. However, his discoveries were not uh, identified and come to light until 1984. So he was not credited with these until much, much later. So independently, these were discovered uh, uh, later and uh, Charles Messier added them to his catalog in 1764. This uh, this cluster is is visible uh, through through any small telescope. It's it's not uh, not hard to see. It's about fourteen light years in diameter, and it's about four thousand light years away. It's uh, further it's further away than many other star clusters that are closer to us. If it was as close as some of them, it would uh, outshine them by by quite a bit. It's also a rather young cluster. It's about 25 million years old uh, with some very hot, uh, bright uh, blue uh, main sequence stars. Um, and it lacks any red giants because it is a new, a new cluster. This spectacular object on the screen is called the Cigar Galaxy also called Messier number 82. It is in the 
Ursa Major. It's just below the ladle on the Big Dipper, if you're looking at that. This is a fantastic starburst galaxy, approximately 12 million light years away in the constellation Ursa Major. Um, they've recently discovered in that fantastic burst of stars there, um, several spiral arms. The light you see in there, in the center, in the core, is from at least 200 massive clusters of about 200,000 stars each. And these are all large and bright stars. It also has two black holes in, uh, in the center, near each of the two lobes that are very bright stars that you're seeing there. The slash down the middle is dust that's caused by, as an aftermath of all these stellar uh, ignitions that are going on in there. When you look at this object around the edges, those are the normal stars. There are uh, several hundred billion normal stars around that center core of fantastic star creation. Uh, as I said, about 200 massive clusters of over 200,000 stars each are causing that light to form. And that's Messier object number 82. My next object is M3, or the third object in Messier's catalog of objects that aren't comets. It's also known as NGC 5272. It's a globular cluster in Keynes Venatici. Now, what is a globular cluster? Well, a globular cluster is what it sounds like. It's, it's a huge association of stars that are all tightly packed together in one glob. That's a highly technical term. This was discovered in, by Messier in 1764. So uh, very early on in Messier's uh, cataloging. It's an easy object for, for uh, spotting with a telescope or even a pair of binoculars if you have one. Um, just look for what will look like a kind of a fuzzy patch uh, in the, uh, the area of uh, where it should be in the sky of Keynes Venetici. It has a very bright core for um, globulars. And in my image, uh, you'll see that I've, I've uh, set the exposure so that it isn't overexposed in the center. And you can see that the stars, as they get closer to the center, get more tightly packed. This particular globular cluster has over 500,000 stars in that central core. Uh, although you can't see them all, uh, there's almost a half a million stars in that core. It's 34,000 light years away. This is one of the one of the more distant of the globular clusters from our galactic core. Usually globular clusters hang around the center of our galaxy, kind of like flies buzzing around a nest. However, this one uh, is quite a ways off and it leads astronomers to believe that it might have been a captured uh, globular or maybe even the leftover center of a galaxy that the Milky Way ate millions or billions of years ago. This particular uh, globular is 11 billion years old. So it's been around for a very, very long period of time. It also is rather unique in that astronomers have found a large number of variable stars, more so than most globulars have. Variable stars are stars that change in brightness rhythmically over a period of time. So this is M3 in Keynes Venetici. 
This object is Messier 37, also known as the salt and pepper cluster. It's an open star cluster. It's considered to be one of the finest in the sky. For an open cluster, it's actually still fairly dense. The cluster was uh, first discovered by Giovanni Battista Hederna uh, around 1654, but um, Hederna's observations were unknown until his writings were found uh, in 1984. So long, long after his discovery was, was it discovered that he had found it first. Um, there's, there's two other companion uh, star clusters in this area, um, M36 and M38. Uh, they were both discovered by Lee Gentel, uh, but he missed this one. He did not uh, find M37. So it was independently um, discovered by Charles Messier who found it in 1764. It uh, contains about 150 primary stars of stars with magnitudes of nine to 12.5. Total membership is, of is, is are probably around 500 stars. It covers an area nearly as large as, as the full moon. It's a very large cluster. And it includes a, a bright uh, orange star. You can see off to the left there, there's a very bright orange star. That's actually part of this cluster. So this cluster extends out beyond the beyond the the, the bright core there. It's about four thousand six hundred light years away, and it's got a total diameter of about twenty five light years. It also um, is an older uh, cluster. It does contain um, at least a dozen red giant stars with, within it, which are stars which are larger and towards the end of their getting towards the end of their lives. Open clusters are also uh, really cool to look at in small telescopes. So if you have a small telescope or even binoculars, um, pull it out and uh, try to find some of these objects. You can, you can go to uh, a lot of online sources or apps to find out uh, where they're at. And as Rick said, this is uh, M37. So you just would put in M M37 and your app or planetarium program and the program I used, uh, well, the planetarium program will be able to show you where it's at in the night sky and try to find them. And there's many free planetarium programs available uh, for uh, phones. If you go look on uh, Android and, and uh, Apple stores, you'll, you'll find several good uh, free apps that can help you locate these objects. This object has got a new general catalog number, NGC 2360, but it also has a name as Caroline's Cluster. One of the uh, new age of astronomers that really brought uh, astronomy forward and got to be uh, much more discoveries made was William Herschel, but he actually was an orchestra conductor. And he had heard that making a, a parabolic mirror for a telescope, uh, if he got looked at the re light reflection patterns from it, it would have an order that was like chords of music. So that he could be a better composer and an orchestra conductor, he started making telescopes. And he spent the rest of his career doing two things, one being the conductor of the Bath Symphony Orchestra in England, and the other was building 400 telescopes for himself and for other people. Um, he ended up, because of his accomplishments, uh, being given a residence on uh, at Buckingham Palace, working uh, with King George III as his personal astronomer. But what this object is, the reason it's called Caroline's Cluster, is it was his sister who discovered this. His sister he brought over from Austria because he needed a singer in the orchestra. But she was watching his astronomy and kept correcting his math. So she sent her to uh, Oxford where she got all the possible mathematics that were uh, available in that era. And she became one of the most profound mathematicians as well as astronomers um, of the time. She found 11, 11 comets on her, on her own, and she uh, actually was awarded a gold medal from what had become Prussia 
when the countries had uh, kept changing their boundaries. But the uh, King of Prussia awarded her a gold medal as the person from Prussia who had accomplished the most notable um, achievement in, in the world. She was 92 years old when she was awarded that. Uh, she actually traveled from England to Prussia to accept it. She lived to be 96 years old, and she was an astronomer for 72 of those years. This is a cluster she found in Canis Major. That's the dog cluster. Uh, it's got the dog star, Sirius, and one reason it's called uh, uh, the dog star is that just happened? Oh, that's why summer in August is called the dog, uh, the dog days of summer. Is that's where the sun happens to go through that area. So this cluster was discovered by Caroline and, on 26th of February in 1783. And she described it as a beautiful cluster of pretty compressed stars near a half a degree in diameter. Now, half a degree is a, is a full moon. Uh, her notes were overlooked until her brother, William, included her cluster in a 1786 catalog of a thousand clusters and nebulae. And he acknowledged her as the discoverer. The age of this cluster, 2.2 billion years old. That's very old for an open cluster. Normally the galactic momentum, uh, uh, the spin of the galaxy and the gravity of the stars around it that make up the galaxy will pull clusters apart eventually. This one is held together for 2.2 billion years. Its diameter is about 15 light years across, and it's 3,700 light years from Earth. But there is Caroline's cluster. My next object is somewhat unusual. Uh, we're going to look at a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, an edge-on spiral galaxy. However, there's something unusual about this particular spiral galaxy, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. First of all, this spiral galaxy that we're going to be looking at here, and you can see it just to the, uh, the right of this bright star, this is it here, uh, goes by the name of IC332A. And it's a very faint, 13th magnitude, uh, and that's very dim, uh, small edge on spiral galaxy in the constellation Virgo. It's 46 million light years away. Now, what's unusual about it? Well, if we zoom in and look right about there, about two thirds of the way out from the central core, you'll see a, a kind of a brightish zone right there. That is being illuminated by a supernova. Uh, this supernova was discovered on March 30th this year by the Zwicky Transient Facility um, which is an automated camera system at Palomar Mountain. Uh, a lot of these transients are picked up now by automated observatories uh, rather than uh, professional astronomers or even amateur astronomers. It's currently at magnitude 14, uh, the supernova itself. And it's a type 1a supernova. Now, what does that mean? A type 1a supernova is actually two stars that are next to each other. They orbit around each other. One of the stars is typically a white dwarf. The, the other star typically is a giant star, possibly a red giant. And what happens is the white dwarf is accreting mass or sucking in mass from the red giant. Because they're so close to each other, it can actually vacuum in material from the other star. Now what happens is that that mass coming into the 
white dwarf star keeps piling up more and more and more of it keeps coming in and piling up around the, the, the white dwarf star until it finally reaches um, a, a limit and it's called the carbon fusion limit and it explodes in an enormous display of energy um, in the 10 to the 40, 40, I'm sorry, the 10 to the 44th joule range. If that means anything to you, uh, but that's an enormous amount of energy. And that's why we call it a supernova. And they're extremely bright because of it. And they can be seen at enormous distances. So this one star exploding and bright, lighting up that area uh, is uh, being seen at a distance of 46 million light years away. Type 1a supernovas are used as a standard candle by professional astronomers when it's very difficult to tell a, the distance to a particular galaxy. Uh, if there's a type 1a supernova that happens within that galaxy, they can zero in on the distance because type 1a supernovas always explode at the same brightness level. So you can tell by plugging in the numbers into formulas exactly how far away they are. So this is a supernova in the uh, galaxy 1c3322. So in this picture, we're not looking at one single object. We're looking at close to 20. Everything you're seeing in this image that is not uh, close to a pinpoint of light is a galaxy. This is known as Markarian's chain. It makes a little chain of galaxies, but every little smudge of light you see here is a galaxy. There's a galaxy up here. There's one down here, there's three or four down here, there's a couple faint ones there. Um, the bright one here is known as uh, Messier 86. Messier saw this, this object and he, he cataloged it. This is a, um, known as a lenticular galaxy, that's its shape. On either side of it here we have a couple spiral galaxies that we're seeing edge on, another lenticular galaxy up here. And then down here, these two galaxies are companions. They're known as the eyes galaxies. They are uh, intertwined with each other. And they're, they're so close that they've warped each other. If you look at the lower one here, you can see some wispy structure kind of curving around it. The little companion here has caused that disruption. They've been swirling around each other and distorting their, their shape. They were uh, first discovered in the, in the 19th century. They've been, they've been known, for, known for quite a while. These galaxies are all located up in the Virgo constellation. It's known as the Virgo super cluster of galaxies. And although you're seeing a lot of galaxies in this image frame, if I were to reorient my telescope to the left, to the right, up or down, we'd get more galaxies. There are hundreds of galaxies in this region of space. One reason we can see so many galaxies is uh, when we're looking up at Virgo at this time of year, we're actually pointed um, outside the plane of our galaxy, of our own galaxy. So we're looking more out into space, deeper space, and we can see all these galaxies. They're, they're all at varying distances. The, uh, the eyes galaxies are about 37 million light years away. The, uh, the larger one is about 98,000 light years across, which is a fairly large, large galaxy. This uh, tasty little object is called 
the whale galaxy. Its catalog number is NGC 4631. Now, one of the things we talk about is, uh, with the exception of one or two items, they're either, we either use their NGC, their new general catalog number, or we use the Messier number. And Messier objects also have NGC numbers because the NGC catalog was developed by an astronomer named John Dreyer based on the findings of William Herschel, Caroline Herschel, and William's son, John Herschel. And he put the very first new general catalog together uh, of right around 1880 um, to, to try to get one single resource for uh, people. Uh, Caroline Herschel had a lot of open clusters and planetary nebula to her name. Her uh, brother John had a lot of galaxies that he had discovered and other structures in the sky, multiple stars especially. And so among them, they had a lot of information. Then more astronomers jumped in and more and more, and it's been expanded uh, several times ever since. Um, but this object right here, uh, uh, NGC 4631, it's called, it's got two names. It's either called the whale galaxy or it's called the mackerel. And because back when names were being handed out for these things, if we go back a century or so, uh, with the quality of the optical devices that were available, they looked like animals that they thought they could discover. Now, this is in the constellation Canis fanatici, and that means the hunting dogs. And uh, the way to find this, uh, it's a real interesting constellation because you'll only see two stars that make it up. If you follow the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper, that's the arc, and you follow it to the next bright star you see, a very bright star called Arcturus. So you arc to Arcturus, and it's in a constellation that looks sort of like a kite. That constellation is called Bodhis, or Bodhis, and he is the herdsman of the bears. He's the one who's supposed to keep the uh, uh, little dipper, I mean, the, uh, the little bear and the uh, Canis Major and uh, Ursa Major in the sky because they keep terrorizing villages and it keeps driving uh, uh, the deities uh, a little bit angry. So anyway, Otis is supposed to keep those dog, uh, keep those uh, bears up there, but he's got two dogs that help him. And between him or Arcturus and the handle of the, of the Big Dipper are these two stars that make up the constellation Canis Fanatici, the, the guard dogs for keeping Ursa Major and Ursa Minor in the sky. Okay, this constellation, or this item is a galaxy. Uh, it's a uh, barred spiral galaxy. It's about 30 million light years away from us. It's a slightly distorted wedge shape. Um, and that's why they thought it looked a little bit like a whale. This thing contains uh, a central starburst region. You can see the bright zones in the middle. If you'll remember when we were looking at the Cigar Galaxy or Messier number 82, there were uh, hundreds of areas with hundreds of thousands of stars being born. This isn't quite as active, but you can see that there are, are several bright zones where stars are being born. There's about 200 billion stars making up the rest of the shape you see, and there are probably a half a billion stars right there in the starburst area near the center. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for uh, watching our virtual star party. We uh, enjoy putting them on probably, uh, hopefully as much as you enjoy watching them. Um, we had a good wide variety of objects to be able to uh, show you um, under some dark, uh, good Arizona sky. So that's really cool. And uh, hopefully you were able to learn a little bit about astronomy. So what I want to do now is uh, just kind of go around the horn with each of the astronomers and give them a minute or so to uh, wrap things up. So we'll start with Bernie. Well, thank you, Jim. And uh, I, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed, our, enjoyed our little presentation here. Uh, we've uh, tried to uh, simulate the uh, Grand Canyon Star Party as best we can. Um, I know uh, that uh, a lot of people are, are 
disappointed that they couldn't make it but uh, this year, but we're all looking forward to next year and hopefully we'll have it uh, uh, in person again and back how we used to do it. And this is Rick Paul. I want to thank everyone for, for joining us tonight for this. Uh, it was a lot of fun for us. Uh, we always uh, learn things too when we do this. Uh, and the one thing I always like to encourage people to do is go outside at night and look up. Uh, if you own a pair of binoculars, take them outside and uh, look up. I think you'll be surprised at what you can see on your own. And I'm Jim O'Connor, and this is so much fun to be able to get together and pull a lot of astronomy together and try to help all of you get introduced to your home universe. There's a lot of things out there that are wonderful to look at and to contemplate. So if you ever get a chance, get out under the night sky and look up. And any of the stories of the constellations you may have heard, make up your own. There's no one right way to look at the sky. It's all just beautiful and it's all just out there for us to uh, be able to bring us a little bit of peace, a little bit of a little bit of happiness, a little bit of uh, finding our way around the world. So thanks for uh, tuning in to watch uh, this event. And we hope to see you again at the next time.